Hello and welcome to the UP Open University Diploma in Land Use Planning, Land Use Analysis Matrix featuring Puerto Princesa City. Presenting Team ABCs. Good day. This is ELP Vince Alcantara, Planning Officer from the City Government of Puerto Princesa. Hello everyone. I'm Paula Ibolson. I'm a licensed civil engineer from the municipality of Pinmalay, Pangasinan. Hello and good day. I'm architect John Edward Kanda from the municipality of Kawit, province of Cavite. Hi, I'm Jessica Julia Carino, a registered and licensed architect, a graphic designer, 3D visualization artist, and a mom of two beautiful toddlers from Angela City, Pampanga. Good evening, everyone. I am Donna Jean Seriola, a first-year student of Diploma in Land Use Planning. I'm a licensed geodetic engineer, and I graduated my bachelor's degree at Bicol University College of Engineering. Good day, everyone. I'm Mrs. Kishua, a registered and licensed architect, master plumber, and a real estate broker. I'm currently residing in Pasig City and representing the National Capital Region. Right now, I'm engaged in the design and build services and doing general construction. On this presentation, we will discuss about the introduction and overview, forest land use, municipal waters, agriculture, and lastly, the summary as a recap. There will be four types of analysis that will be discussed on each land use, and that will be the descriptive analysis, which will help us to describe the data points in a constructive way, diagnostic analysis, which will help us examine the data and answer the question, why did it happen? Third will be the predictive analysis, which will determine the future performance based on the historical data. And lastly, prescriptive analysis, which will help us organize and make better decisions through the analysis of raw data. Good day. Let me introduce you to the city of Puerto Princesa. The highly urbanized city of Puerto Princesa is located 306 nautical miles southwest of Manila, 105 nautical miles from Panay, and about 250 nautical miles from Sumbuanga, is bounded on the north by the municipalities of Rojas and San Vicente, and in the south by the municipality of Borla. Its western side faces the West Philippine Sea, while along its eastern coast lies the Sulu Sea. Now you can see the location of Puerto Princesa relative to the Philippines. Puerto Princesa City is a local land area of 219,000. 339.40 hectares, making it the second largest city in the country after Davao City. The total area of the rural barangays is 14,716 hectares, with the rural barangays of combined area of 204,620 hectares. Based on 2020 census of population and housing, Puerto Princesa has a population of 307,079 with an annual growth rate. 3.71%. The most populous barangays are San Pedro, San Jose, Siksikan, Santa Monica, and San Miguel. 2015 and 2010, the population of Puerto Princesa are 250,166 and 222,670 respectively. Here you can see the population density of Puerto Princesa City. And as you can see, the population is concentrated in the urban areas. Well, the land area of Puerto of Puerto City is 219,339.40 hectares, where the A and D amounts to 50,301.70 hectares. The forest land is 169,037 hectares. As for Timberland, it's around 18,210.98 hectares, and the unclassified public forest is around 150,826.93 hectares. As the Sudan claim approved is around 18,526.13 hectares, while the pending claims is around 79,772 hectares. Hectares. To continue, the Palawan Flora Fauna and Watershed Reserve has a total area of 8,000 hectares. 
while the Puerto Princesa Subterranean River National Park, which was voted in 2012 by the global community as one of the new seven wonders of the world, spans 22,202 hectares and 41,350 hectares for the Cleopatra's Needle Forest Reserve which is one of the oldest and most diverse forests in the country and was declared as a critical habitat. The total area for the forest reservation is 71,552 hectares. Moving forward, the team has picked three major land uses from Ridge Strip to conduct the land use analysis, which are forests, the municipal waters, and agriculture. The land use number one is forests. The first part discusses about the descriptive analysis. In 2015, Puerto Princesa's forest land area covers 69% of the 219,339.40 hectares total area. In the same year, there is a 3.56% decline recorded from the 72.56% forest land cover in 2005. As can be seen in the map, the majority of the land area is colored green which is zoned to forest land use. Now, the community has different point of views depending on the culture and organizations from which they came from. For the environmental conservation groups, majority of the benefits that forest land offers to the human population are oxygen supply, carbon sequestration, and aquifer recharge. In the map shown, the variety of forest types are found in the city of Puerto Princesa, which are primary, secondary, ultramafic, limestone, and the mangrove forest. Now this figure shows the land classification of Puerto Princesa. However, the diminishing coverage of forests is attributed to the encroachment of other land uses and the deforestation of the mangrove forest. On the other hand, the current scenario will deprive the city of a large source of additional cash and other benefits, both tangible and intangible. From the developer's standpoint, in terms of land classifications for profit maximization, there is an additional 23,387.93 hectares of land if the 18% slope allowable for developments will be strictly followed. This figure shows the slope map of Puerto Princesa. There is only so much land that can be put onto the market, and once the title is transferred to private owners, the parcels are promptly assessed for real estate tax reasons. Finally, the unclassified public forest is effectively in limbo in terms of environmental regulation because it is vulnerable to speculative claims and even unlawful occupation resulting to resource depletion and overexploitation. This figure shows that 30% are unclassified public forests followed by ancestral domain and ancestral domain claim pending which is 15.7%. Now, moving on to the second part, which is a diagnostic analysis. A city within forests is the Puerto Princesa city's vision. It fosters a balanced development in the city while protecting its natural resources. But the depletion of its forests hinders the local government to achieve their ultimate goal. Although the proportion shows a minimal drop of 3.56%, it is necessary to act on it while the rate is still manageable. To be able to address this concern, it is important to determine the root cause of the problem in order to prevent it to further increase in the future. This figure shows the five wise analysis to the problem decrease of forest covers from 2005 to 2015. This analysis asks the question why five times in order to determine the root cause of the problem. The first why is land use activities such as agriculture and informal settlements are encroaching. Why? There isn't enough land for urban and growth center expansion. Why? No official land reclassification results in zoning restrictions that are not properly implemented. Why? The forest land use plan is not strictly enforced and monitored. Why? No enforcement division under the City Environment and Natural Resources Office. Now, we see that there are plans and policies available to the Puerto Princesa City However, they lack in implementation and monitoring. Now, this answers the root cause to the problem of decrease in forest covers from 2005 to 2015. 
For the succeeding land use analysis, architect Jack Carino will discuss the prediction and prescription based on the descriptive and diagnostic analysis presented. Thank you, architect John. Now let's proceed to the predictive analysis. The decrease in forest covers due to the migration and expansion of areas for future development was based on the increasing ratio of population in AND, also known as alienable and disposable land, from 4.8 persons per hectare to 5.01 persons per hectare and has an increasing growth rate from 2.06% in 2010 to 20.62 in 2015. Moreover, the mangrove forest has 50 hectare annual rate of depletion per year, which is likely to decrease the function of the watershed, ecological, and wildlife habitat. On the next slide, we will discuss about the impact chain analysis matrix on the decrease of forest cover from 2005 to 2015 in the city of Puerto Princesa. Now on this illustration, in figure FO-6, the impact chain analysis on the decrease of forest cover from 2005 to 2015 indicates that it started with a forest cover change driver pertaining to the encroachment of different land use, which leads to hazards, specifically deforestation, soil erosion, surface runoff, and which leads to hazard exposure, specifically flash flood, intensifying storm surge, greenhouse gas, and fewer crops. And lastly, the impact of this will lead to desertification, climate imbalance, wildlife extinction, habitat loss, and loss of biodiversity. Now to further explain the impact chain analysis illustration on the previous slide, now let's go deeper to the forest cover change driver. With an increased demand for land for agricultural, industrial, and urban land use to meet the needs of a growing population and rapid urbanization, land use will inevitably shift to meet the demand. Furthermore, because there is no formal land categorization in the city, there is no change in the percentage of the classified and unclassified forest. As a result, encroachments in unclassified forest lands may occur, resulting in a change in forest cover or deforestation. Furthermore, the land cover percentage changed over the years from 2015 up to 2025, as it can be seen on this table FO-1, the rate of land cover change in forest land use continues to decline with a percentage of negative 0.50 by the year 2025. The forest land cover is projected to be 65.61%, which is less than 3.39% from 2015 and less than 6.95% after 20 years. As we may all know, the removal of forest cover or tree plantations for agricultural, industrial, or urban uses is known as deforestation. It involves permanently removing forest cover to create land suitable for residential, commercial, or industrial usage. Land cover decreases in forest land use, resulting in decreased vegetation cover. It causes an increase in water surface runoff in upland forests, which flushes down fast escalating floods in low-lying places. These precarious occurrences impose adverse consequences on the natural resources and their inhabitants. The second part of the illustration is the hazard exposure, and that is the improper land conversion and unrestrained urban expansion which are major contributors to the watershed's deterioration. The non-compliance with the designed land use classification of land as well as the unmanaged creeping of developments into areas that should be preserved and protected for natural preservations in terms of source of resources and natural buffers are examples of man-made causes of impending danger when exposed to hazards. For example, the unabated quarrying and logging in the Sierra Madre mountain range and other mountainous areas of Luzon contributed to the devastating flooding that followed typhoon. Ulysses. So this puts the low-lying barangays of Puerto Princesa in peril of floods. Third part of the illustration is the hazard exposure. Similarly, the continued degradation of mangrove forest has left coastal communities vulnerable to the storm surges caused by strong winds from typhoons. 54 out of 66 barangays in Puerto Princesa City are considered coastal. As a result, 
the storm surge threatens 81.82% of the total barangays in the city. In simplest terms, for every 11 barangays in Puerto Princesa, 9 are considered coastal. The fourth part of the illustration is the hazard impacts. The habitat for wildlife and biodiversity is just as vital as the natural buffers between land and water. According to park management's initial estimates, at least 2,200 trees in the city of Puerto Princesa were damaged by Typhoon Odette, including many century-old native diptera carps. Wildlife suffers as a result of habitat destruction or loss. In the article of Fabro in 2022, he expressed the concern about the long-term survival of wildlife. We hypothesized that, because of the strong typhoon, the flowers that would have been fruits by summertime serving as food for wildlife, they might have been blown away. Therefore, there would be famine in the wild and eventually the wildlife might die out. A typhoon causes climate imbalance because it causes wildlife extinction, habitat loss, and biodiversity loss. Temperature is one aspect that influences plant growth. Moreover, it affects every chemical and physical process associated with plants such as mineral solubility, water, gas absorption, synthesis growth, and reproduction, all of which have an impact in Puerto Princesa City's major economic activities, which are agriculture and fisheries, in addition to tourism and commerce. Furthermore, it will have an impact on the production of fresh, dried, and marinated fish, octopus, cuttlefish, fingerlings, and seaweeds. Moving on to the prescriptive analysis. The city of Puerto Princesa's local government plays a vital role as the primary planning authority for developing implementing and monitoring plans we presented many potential remedies based on the determined root cause of the decline of forest cover from 2005 to 2015 and the consequences it had on the city's future finally puerto princesa city's goal is to provide a safe living environment for its residents by guaranteeing that they live in an ecologically balanced safe and climate-friendly setting. The following prescriptive analysis is a table showing the proposed programs, projects, activities, agenda, and policies that will address the enforcement of CENRO and minimize forest land cover depletion. The items on the table are grouped into four according to the observed conditions. The first observed condition is the contrasting land use activities such as agricultural and informal settlements encroaching on forest land. Possible implications, decreased in forest cover, disturbance to the wildlife habitat, decrease in the flow of ecosystems and changes in land cover that affects climate regulation. The proposed programs, projects, activities, and policies are the following. Classify the remaining unclassified forest lands of the city. Identify areas for protection. Monitoring of migrants living in the forest lands. Relocation and housing project for illegal occupants. Protected area management project. And pursue agroforestry. The second observed condition is the lack of forestry knowledge and understanding. Possible implications, inappropriate forest research inappropriate forest resource management, inefficient wildlife management and preservation, proposed programs, projects, activities, and policies, prioritize research and development, and support research initiatives on rehabilitation and restoration activity. The third condition that was observed is regarding the public organizations, institutions, agencies, and the general community. The possible implications? participation of the general public, community development, general population that will support the local government's forest land resource and management, and the proposed programs, projects, activities, and policies are the following. Increase participation of the communities, strengthen penalty and accountability of violators, and capability building of business applicants on environmental management plan. Fourth and last observed condition. The local government should strengthen stringent implementation and monitoring of the forest land use plan. Possible implications? Implementing the forest land use plan, migration to the forest protected areas, 
preservation of mangrove forest, avoidance of unwanted land cover change, and urbanization. Proposed programs, projects, activities, and policies. Deputize one zoning officer in each rural barangay cluster. Strict implementation of the zoning ordinance. Active participation of the city. And finally, strategic mangrove reforestation and conservation program. Now, taking second land use, the municipal waters recover, which embraces coastal and marine ecosystems. And we'll be discussing this using the four analysis. First, scale analysis. Coastline of Puerto Princesa stretches to a total length of 416 kilometers on both sides of the island. Service area with municipal waters of 327,580 hectares is almost 67% larger than its total land area. In addition, three major embayments serve as excellent fishing grounds and important tourism resources. The bay and in part of the bay on the eastern side, and the Lucan Bay on the west coast. Puerto Princesa, there are 82 and 20 associated mango species, belonging to 40 families and 27 genera of vascular plants. Satellite data in 2004 indicate a total mango forest cover of 6,499.05 hectares, widely distributed throughout the coastline, but with the highest concentrations of three bays of both Honda, Lugan, and Puerto Princesa. Serving as sanctuary for fisheries, these mango forests are being promoted as ecological tourism destinations. Here you can see the river and streams which are draining to the coastal areas of Puerto Princesa City. Mangroves, seagrass meadows, and coral reefs constitute marine life in the coastal marine area of Puerto Princesa City. Mangroves serve as sanctuary for fisheries, seagrass meadows, and important grazing areas for sea turtles, seagulls, and other marine wildlife. Coral reefs provide sanctuary for dolphins and fish and are spawning ground for different fish species. Currently, only 7.34% of the total municipal waters are identified as marine protected areas. These low in comparison with the suggested 15% of Republic Act number 8850 of the Philippine. Here you can see the watershed map of Puerto Princesa. Speedos and both fishing areas for sea turtles, sea cows, are locally known as dugong, and other marine wildlife which are highly prized components of sea based recreation and tourism experiences. And seagrass meadows covering white areas are found in some portions of Puerto Princesa Bay, particularly in Bangkabangkao, Iwahig, and Mangista. Certain portions of Honda Bay from San Pedro to Tagboros, the island, and Tadjo, Pondiado Island, in deeper waters off the coast from Pondiado to Binduyan. Generally, the west coast and the inner portions of the bay are sparse growth of seagrass due to the effect of siltation from rounded soil. Coral reefs provide sanctuary for the juvenile fish that are not yet ready for harvesting. They are therefore an indispensable support to the fishing industry. The Puerto Princesa, the western coast is found to have generally poor coral cover except in two areas, Pinanganakan Island in the north and near Barangay Napsan in the south. The coral cover is mostly found along the eastern seaboard, particularly off the coast of Barangay Camuning in large portions of the bay. Surfing and sensing growth of these marine habitats in order that they can perform their ecological services as well as yield sustainable economic value are continuing challenge to the physical development of Puerto Princesa. Vision map of Puerto Princesa at 100 meters in further. Now, we go to the diagnostic analysis which will be given to us by Engineer Sariola. Municipal Waters Diagnostic Analysis 
Unsustainable fishing practices like overfishing of the local community, illegal fishers fishing by commercial large-scale fisheries, and destructive fishing practices were perceived by the local communities as driver or pressure that has negatively impacted the quality of the coastal marine environment. Siltation and sedimentation also affect the coastal ecosystems as well as tourism development in coastal barangays. Man-made threats coupled with climate-induced elevated sea surface temperature and ocean acidification endangered coastal marine ecosystem, specifically coral reefs. The six anthropogenic threats need to be addressed include the following on the next slide. One of the six anthropogenic threats is coastal tourism and activities. The activities of tourists can affect the marine ecosystem directly through boat and anchor damage to coral reefs and indirectly by increasing demands for clear lands for development, collection of shells for souvenirs, seafood and mangrove poles, and coral lime for construction. Number 2. Tremendous Sediment Washout Tremendous loads of sediment wash out to sea can overwhelm nearby coral reefs that require clean waters for their existence. Saltation damages seagrass beds, those affecting its provision of ecosystem services. Number 3. Sea level rise and coastal erosion. Sea level is rising at about 1 mm per year, which, under normal circumstances, habitats can adapt to, but the loss of inshore coral reefs and coastal mangrove forests adds to the potential damage caused by sea level rise in coastal erosion. Number 4. Poaching of Marine Wildlife Poaching of marine wildlife such as turtles, dugongs and harvesting of corals for decorative purposes and capture of endangered marine species. Number 5. Overexploitation and Commercial Fishing Overexploitation of local fisheries, dynamite and cyanide fishing, use of small mesh nets, encroachment of commercial fishing operations inside municipal waters. Number 6. Anthropogenic Threats Mangrove Harvesting and Clearing Harvesting of mangrove for timber and fuel, clearing of mangrove for settlements. Now, now we will delve into the issue analysis. The current trend from the diagnostic analysis will continue. The following will become a reality. First, no fish catch that lead to food insecurity and low income for fisher folks. Second, low tourism viability. Third, biodiversity decline and extinction of marine species. Now, let us look at the impact flow concerning municipal waters. First, dynamite and cyanide fishing, anchoring from tourist boats, sedimentation, sediment, and sedimentation, would lead to damage to coral reefs and seagrass bed, and would have low aesthetic value for tourism. Poaching of fishing, encroachment of commercial fisheries to municipal waters, would affect recovery rate of the reef fishes, and would lead to fishing competition with local fisher folks. Harvesting of mangroves and corals will decrease, in the, decrease the mangrove area and will lessen the ecosystem service that is with an attenuation when there is storm surge. All of this will lead to food insecurity, habitat loss and habitat destruction, damage to properties, extinction of marine species, as a livelihood, and decrease in income. Municipal Waters Prescriptive Analysis Prescriptive Analysis Coastal resources are a huge natural and economic resource in terms of food supply, livelihood, other revenue, and quality of environment. To alleviate coastal and marine degradation, preservation and enhancement of marine habitats should be done in order that they can perform ecological services as well as yield sustainable economic value. Here are prescriptive analysis based on our observed conditions. Number one, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, unprotected rights of fisher folk. 
the possible implication was unlimited access to fishery and aquatic resources. The proposed program of project activities and policies is a strict enforcement of fisheries code. Number two, marine protected areas and sanctuaries not meeting the suggested 15% of municipal water area as stipulated in RA 8550. The possible implication would be unprotected important habitats and representative samples of marine life. Proposed program was to ordinance establishing additional marine protected area or fish sanctuaries. Number three, observe conditions, need of protection of wildlife resources and their habitats. Possible implication may be illegal, illegally traded wildlife. The proposed program should be capacitate law enforcers on the Wildlife Act. Next is the deputation of wildlife law enforcement officers. Number four, observed conditions was deficiency of sustainable livelihood. Possible implication, no access to basic needs and no opportunity to thrive. Proposed program, provisions of livelihood to coastal communities. Number five, observed conditions. The growing of settlement areas in coastal communities. Possible implication, coastal communities are more vulnerable to different hazards. Proposed program, provision of settlement areas to informal settlers in coastal communities and in mangrove areas. Number six, prescriptive analysis. Damage to coral reefs from tourism activities. Possible implication, lack of corals may increase the power of waves hitting the coast. Proposed programs, establishment of mooring buoys in tourist areas, specifically near coral reefs. Establishment of coral nursery and farming. Number seven, illegal and destructive fishing, poor solid waste management, and other human activities. Possible implication, lack enforcer to stop destructive fishing practices and reducing pressure in coastal water. Possible implication, habitat loss. Proposed program, strengthening of Bantay Dagat, Bantay Bakawan Task Forces, capacity building for city or barangay fisheries and aquatic resources management council, maritime group in the LGU for the surveillance of municipal waters, imposition of environmental fee for conservation and protection of marine resources. Number eight, the observed condition was the need of authorization of chief safety inspection services, issuance of special permit to carry dangerous cargoes or goods, performance of ship safety enforcement function and marine casualty investigation for Philippine registered ships engaged in domestic operations that made and entered by in between. The possible implication is possible marine vessel accident. Proposed program, Memorandum of Understanding between Philippine Coast Guard and the PNP. Number 9. Observed condition, need for additional activities that should be implemented to support coastal resource management. Possible implication, low awareness of communities on coastal resources. Proposed program, Information and Education Campaign on Coastal Resources Management Formulation and Enforcement of Detailed Ordinance on Fisheries Management Shoreline Development Periodic Monitoring of Coastal Resources Number 10 Observe Condition Coastal Communities are at risk from natural like hurricane, storm surge, cyclone, tsunamis, and floods and human-induced disasters the possible implication, damage to property, and possible loss of lives. Proposed program, rehabilitation of denoded mangrove areas. Mangroves and salt marshes not only serve as a buffer from storm damage, but also provide areas for fish spawning and nursery areas for both inshore and offshore capture fisheries. They also observe heavy metals and other toxic substances. For this part of the presentation, we will be discussing the agriculture land use of Puerto Princesa City. Taken from the CDP Volume 2 of the 20, as of 2015, the total area 
prescriptive analysis. Grow local, buy local, and eat local has been the battle cry of the city agriculturists to encourage the locals to patronize their own produce. Moreover, production planning was encouraged to ensure that farmers do not plant the same kind of vegetable in one cropping season. Hence, it is necessary to have a proposal on education of farmers so they can maximize the yield of the land. A case in point, here are the farmers in Barangay, Busbiminda, and Mangingisda who are informal settlers but were given two hectares of land to till. To level up their knowledge on crops, they should be trained so that they will not be subsistence farmers. LGU may also provide incentives to farmers and to create a program that will promote agricultural as a career path for the young generations to take. One way to promote this is to include in the high school curriculum farming or agricultural as a subject. This way, the productive of lands can be sustained. A decrease in agricultural land directly results to an insufficient food supply. To prevent this, a moratorium on agricultural land reclassification must be signed to preserve agricultural lands from being converted into either residential or commercial. At the same time, there should be a clear policy on conversion of lands and collaboration among LGU, DAR, and DNR regarding the implementations of the Agrarian Reform Law. We are now on to the diagnostic analysis of Puerto Princesa's agricultural land use. Puerto Princesa City is often described as self-sufficient with food because of its incredible resource in crop production. However, in this graph shown, it can be noted that there was a record of decrease in crop production in the year 2018, particularly in the fruit trees, which covers the largest part of cropland. The same goes for corn, non-irrigated rice, fruit crops, and agroforests. On the other hand, increase in plantation crops, irrigated rice, and vegetables took place within the same year. This table taken from CDP reiterates that much of the yielded crops come from fruit-bearing trees. Although Puerto Princesa is rich with agriculture, it doesn't yield many rice crops. There are, however, three promising agri-products found in the city. Cashew, mango, and banana. The city is, is also much known for its rich fish production, which will be shown on the next table. The city is also known for its rich fish production, which can be seen in this table. It is also worth taking note how many short grains have in terms of their supply and demand, which highlights the stand of rice and grain in the overall production. So let us take a look on what are the root causes in the decrease in crop production of Puerto Princesa based on this diagnostic analysis. First is the First is the steady reduction of agricultural land from 1998 to 2009, averaging six hectares per year, which was mostly due to the conversion of irrigated rice lands to pave way for large-scale investments in commercial developments. This affected the agricultural production, however, only in a minimal scale since most of major crop areas are located in rural barangays. Increase in the investment services 
found in the urban barangays gave room to non-farm employment opportunities. Second is the inadequate infrastructure support. So let's take a look on what are the root causes in the decrease in crop production of Puerto Princesa based on this diagnostic analysis. First is the steady reduction of agricultural land from 1998 to 2009, averaging 6 hectares per year, which was mostly due to the conversion of irrigated rice lands to pave way for larger scale investments in commercial developments. This affected the agricultural production, however, only in a minimal scale, since most of major crop areas are located in rural barangays. Increase in the investment services found in the urban barangays gave room to non-farm employment opportunities. Insufficient infrastructure support facilities in the city's agricultural sector limits the potential of the city and its farmers to increase production. Insufficient production techniques due to lack of programs promoting innovative farming techniques and lack of budget for supplementing continuous training programs makes life hard for most farmers, limiting them to meet their utmost potential with their crop productivity. Insufficient production planning and management A lack of technical management that can provide guidelines and comprehensive planning for crop production can also be a risk in increasing the production. For the predictive analysis, may I call on architect Jess Chua to discuss it to you. Thank you. For predictive analysis, the decrease of extent of area devoted to the agriculture in percent of total land area means that, that the area has been converted to other uses. When the conversion of the agricultural land to a commercial or residential, then there will be an increase in the population of Puerto Princesa. It may even reach a point when there will be a thick population density. In the long run, it will also affect all the food supply since in its demand will be higher even if there are still parcels of land to be taken care of but after a while farmers will start age and they cannot be till the land anymore altogether the built-up area grew from a total coverage of 2421 hectares in 1998 to a total combined area of 3,438 hectares in 2009. Based on this data, it can be seen that there is an annual increase in 101.69 hectares. At this rate, it will take 20 years before the remaining vacant lots will be completely built and assuming that the current densities are maintained and no further agricultural lands, especially those that are in irrigated and irrigable rice land in the urban area, will be converted to residential or other uses. The local government of Puerto Princesa has already introduced productivity enhancement program called the Agricultural Development Program, which focuses on three following subsectors. First is the Mango Development Program, which is designed to provide grafted mango seedlings to farmer cooperators. Second is the strengthening of agro-based cooperatives which conducts management training for cooperatives. It also held seminars on new agricultural farming technologies. Third is the material inputs, which provides 
mechanism to make readily available all the necessary agricultural inputs such as fertilizer, pesticides, and the like. Based on the three previous analyses for this land use, our team proposes some possible and potential interventions that may help address the observed issues and concerns in Puerto Princesa's agricultural land use. Of course, most of these policies was also adopted from the Puerto Princesa City Comprehensive Development Plan 2020-2025 Volumes 1 and 2. For the first observed condition, which is the reduction of agricultural land, LGU should um, implement moratorium on agricultural land reclassification it must be signed to preserve agricultural lands from being converted into either residential or commercial. The LGU should also be clear on policy when it comes to the conversion of lands and Puerto Princesa City should also collaborate on national agencies concerned concerns such as DAR and DENR regarding the implementation of the Agrarian Reform Law. The LGU should also preserve the prime agricultural lands as the vital sources of food and marine sanctuaries and strictly prohibit future encroachment. For the second observed condition, which is inadequate and mismatch infrastructure support for the production sector, the team proposes marafinas and additional programs that will address market issues of the producers. For the second observed condition, which is inadequate and mismatch infrastructure support for the production sector, we propose marafinas and, and additional programs that will address market issues of the producers or traders that cater to the market. The city agriculture office must also prepare investment program for infrastructure support for agriculture. The LGU should also promote eh, The LGU should also promote or incorporate organic farming and herbal farming in the establishment of barangay nurseries. Developing comprehensive and adaptable irrigation systems. For the third observed condition, which is insufficient production techniques, it is necessary for the LGU to propose education on farmers so they can maximize For the third observed condition, which is insufficient production techniques, we propose the necessity to have a um, program on the education of... For the third observed condition, which is insufficient production techniques, it is necessary to have a proposal on the education of farmers so they can maximize the yield of the land. Case in point, or, or an example is the farmers in Barangay Luz Priminda and Mangingista who are informal settlers but were given two hectares of land to till, which will level up their knowledge on crops. And they should be also trained so that they will not be subsistence farmers. Create an education... Create an educational program within sub... Create an edu uh, create an educational program with incentives that can persuade young generations to take up agriculture as a career path. One way in promoting a career in agriculture is including curriculum regarding farming farming techniques, innovation and inventions in agricultural subjects on high school. Increased technology transfer and skills development training in agricultural production. 
For the final observed condition, which is insufficient production planning and management, LGU must enact legislation encouraging big establishments to source out from local farmers. The LGU should also designate an area of clustered barangays for the establishments of Baksakan Center for their products, as well as the establishments of satellite offices, agency units at the Fluk or the Forest Land Use Plan covered barangays to cater to and address different problems. Undertake or use improved methods and techniques in crop production and management, including pest prevention and control. Task is to encourage to promote agroforestry in CBFM and ISF areas and other tenured forest lands. Thank you, Engineer Paula. And to sum it up, let's make a quick recap. We have discussed about the forest land use, municipal waters, and agriculture. And for each land use, we have discussed about the descriptive analysis, diagnostic analysis, predictive analysis, and prescriptive analysis. This has been Ian P. Vincent Cantor. This is Engineer Paula A. Bozan. This has been Architect John Edward Kanda. This has been Jessica Julia Carino. This has been Donna Jean Sayola. And this has been Architect Susie Chua. And this is Steve ABCC.